Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Central St. Martin's Products and Rambic Industrial Design, Design Transforms Lecture Series. My name's Nick Rhodes, and I'm the Program Director for PCID here. In this lecture series, I invite expert practitioners to share their thoughts on the idea of transformation examined through the lens of their work to consider how their practice has changed things, places, businesses, people, and how the act of designing has changed them also. For those of you here in the audience, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the talk, or if you're online via the question and answer bar on your browser. Um, the session is being recorded and will be available for CSM students to see after the event on request. Uh, you can direct your request to me or to Katie Harris, who's here. I can share her email address. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome Mark Saunders. Mark graduated from the Industrial Design Engineering course at the Royal College of Art. We won't say when. It's a <laughs> joint course between the RCA and Imperial College. During his time there, he designed the Strider folding bicycle. The Strider, noted for its simplicity, is featured in the book 50 Bicycles That Changed the World by Alex Newson. Uh, it also changed my life a little bit because I had one. Oh, yeah. Mark is keen that products are affordable and effective, trying to make a positive difference whilst avoiding landfill. Low part count and costs close to, uh, yeah, low part counts and costs close to raw materials to be business and environmentally sustainable and to bring help and joy to at least one user, often Mark himself. <laughs> he describes himself as a mechanical engineer who saw the light. He saw that elegance has a meaning both in engineering and design. So he retrained, retrained back in the day as a designer, as an early graduate of that course I mentioned before. He now works as a designer, engineer and inventor. And from his student project that we talked about, the Strider, to industrial design, kitchen aid, some of which you may own folks, more bicycles and products, some with awards, others with sales, some with neither. It's a rocky ride. Absolutely. Folks, please welcome me, welcome, join me in welcoming Mark Saunders. Thanks, Nick, I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, if you need any spare parts for the Strider, you know where to come. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it's really great to be here. Um, I had a tour this afternoon by one of your students. Uh, thank you, thank you, James. Uh, and this is such an amazing place. You guys are so lucky, you've got so many facilities. And I had no idea how big it was and how good the workshops are. So uh, well done, get in here. Absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Um, I get envious to be honest. <laughs> it's a great place. And I think one of the things that I learned when I was a student was how you could collaborate um, across lots of different departments. And just talking to James, I know he's already doing that, getting to know people in fashion departments and places like that, rather than just, uh, you know, this department. And, and that's a wonderful thing about being here and almost pretty unique in your lives. So treasure it, it's a jewel in your lives. Anyway, today um, I'm gonna ask you and ask you to think very carefully about where you want to take your careers in design, okay? Um, and I'm gonna show you what I chose to do, but we're all unique and so you'll probably have totally different um, inspirations. Um, I'm going to show you what worked and what went wrong. And then at the end, hopefully, if you've got any questions, I'll be able to answer them. Feel free to ask anything, OK? Right, these are the kind of products I work on. And it's really a mix between kind of like general consumer products, which are these things on the top, which generally I've been asked to do rather than I've um, initiated um, and then I just love designing bicycles to be honest. Uh, the thing about bicycles is they're so visceral you know you get on them and you feel part of the world because you're moving with the with the product 
in fact, more than bicycles, it's, it's transport generally that really intrigues me. Um, so this is an overview of, of me and, and my kind of work. But today is more about as much about you guys as well. So I put up this slide and what this slide basically shows are all the potential opportunities you have after you leave this course and choosing where to go. If we just go around the clock, um, you can start your own design piece, small, that's me, I'm a one man band. Or you can do design related abroad. You could be your own design business like uh, Prisman Good or Seymour Powell, enormous great design business. Or you could just do alternative creative stuff. All the stuff you're learning here can be applied all over the place. It doesn't necessarily have to be designed. Uh, through to engineering in house, make your own design and make your own product. <coughs> um, oops, that's the wrong button. Um, or even non-creative design re related stuff. For example, um, one of the people I know that studied design is now a recruiter in the design business. So she understands what makes designers tick and connects designers to work. Through to, as we come down to six o'clock, we've got things like own products and licensing them. That's pretty difficult, as uh, Tim will tell you. Um, and you could be a, a consultant employed within a consultancy. You could go into corporate in-house design and become head of design, general business management. Many designers sort of join Dyson and then become like CEO of Dyson. Well, one. Well, you, um, you can go and teach design. That's really, really satisfying because you know you see you, you, you kind of work, see other people. Um, I'm sure Nick will explain, um, creating their own lives and, and fulfilling themselves and you can become like Nick, head of design. Freelance design and honest, after you finish the course, maybe do a gap year. Anyway, that's a quick round the clock. So just think about those things as we go through what I did. Um, my early influences um, are what kind of fascinated me and also motivated me in later life. And what I find is, talking to people, is people tend to be highly influenced by what happened to them between the years of four and twelve. Because it's before you have any responsibilities and you can just follow your dreams. And the things that influenced me in particular were being taken around steelworks by my grandfather in Sheffield uh, when I was about four. And I was literally this distance away from the blast furnaces. And I mean, now he'd probably be locked up as being, uh, you know, um, by social services for endangering children. But it was such a visceral experience. Now, I'm sure you'll all have your own life stories, but this was mine. Um, and so what, I mean, these are the sort of things that were happening when I was a young kid, but think back to when you were this age and what things that really stirred and motivated you. Um, for me, it was mechanism structures and aesthetics. They were the things that were always fascinating from, and a combination of them. You know, so it, it, mechanics are fascinating, I find, but also structures and, and, and aesthetics um, and the combination of those three have, have motivated and driven me throughout my whole career. So what inspired your journey after, after seeing some of that? Think about it and we'll have a discussion maybe at the end. Um, 2001, A Space Odyssey. It, uh, it, I saw this when I was ooh, 10, uh, shows how old I am. <laughs> but what it showed me was that the future can be created and as product designers we are the people that create it so uh, and we can shape that future wherever we want to shape it so for me this was incredibly inspirational when I was 10. Uh, big jump. Um, I, I 
did the standard kind of A levels and things, and I was wasn't really told about industrial design. It was a question of going into engineering, and so I did a degree in did heavy engineering that kind of thing. Um, but I didn't like heavy engineering because although it taught me a lot about engineering, it wasn't very human scale. Um, useful, incredibly useful, you know, powering the world and powering everything else. But for me personally, I wanted more human scale. So I went to Mars and designed vending machines, which was a lovely combination of mechanisms and aesthetics and things. And at Mars, they had these uh, amazing godlike figures called design consultants. And I thought, ooh, I want to be one of them. I need to become one of them. They're the guys that Mars paid to develop the concepts, which are the core to all products. And actually, probably the most important core to all products, because everything that happens after the concepts influences the whole life cycle of the product. So I wanted to do that, but how do you become a design consultant? Um, and I nearly got a job with what was IDL, but they said, oh, if you get a chance, go to this place. And as an engineer, we sort of got in through the back door, because like Central St. Martins, it was quite hard to get into the RCA. But as an engineer on a new course, it kind of, the odds were better, so I went there. And what I found, just it, it, the, the atmosphere was just like a miniature Central St. Martins, in as much as it was a lot of different departments, and you could go and go into jewellery or fashion, and you meet them all in the bar, and um, you talk about general things, and and I to be honest, I learned as much from the other students as I did from some of the tutors, although they were brilliant as well. Um, and anyway, this uh, I loved it so much. I went back as a tutor and worked there for quite a few years, uh, just one day a week. But I put this slide up again just to make you think, where are you going to be in 20 years time? Now, all these people are all in they're doing all sorts of things like that clock. I mean, we've got people that uh, senior manager at Tesla. We've got people that are um, running their own business. We've got people in uh, branding, people in academia, all sorts of things. But this was them 20 years ago, where you are effectively now. So think where you're going to go. Right, I'm going to just show you a few um, recent projects. Um, these were in collaboration with people and also for myself. Um, the first one was with Joseph Joseph. And if you want to have a look at these kind of um, products could read. I've got some down here. Um, I really like uh, mechanisms and aesthetics and things like that. And one of the sweet things about working with a company in collaboration with a company like Joseph Joseph is they will give you feedback about what their customers want. And that is the most valuable feedback. It's better than I could get by doing kind of like customer surveys. Um, but at the core of something like this is a really complicated little mechanism that has to fit inside the aesthetics and has to work with the, the person. So it's, I find I'm jumping between the mechanics and the aesthetics the whole time and the, you know, the human action. And what this does is basically you run it and turn it very easily, but the mechanism causes a force of 60 kilos, which is needed to press into a can and open it. And it, all my projects start with a kind of sketch and loads and loads of prototypes. Um, so this kind of shows the history of that particular product. This was another collaboration with Joseph Joseph, and it was a bit daunting. They said to me, Mark, we would like a new can opener, uh, sorry, a new corkscrew in our range. And it was a bit daunting because, hey, corkscrew's been done so many times. I mean, the book's just full of alternative corkscrews. What could I bring to the party? And so it was a beautiful brief, actually, because it sent me off in a completely new direction. And I want to show this slide because what we what working with Joseph Joseph in collaboration is it's a two way street. You know, they tell me what they like and what they, they don't like. And we have a load of concepts. 
and then we have to choose which concept we're going to take forward. So I use this as a selection of aspects of concepts to choose and you can see things like you know familiarity is important I mean one of the downsides to what one of my bikes the Strider is to be honest it was a bit weird <laughs> you know so it was down this end of the scale it wasn't familiar so it didn't take off as well as it could have done and then there's things like you know the visual potential it's agricultural or iconic so this these these are the tools I use to select concepts uh, and these are some of the concepts and models and things leading to the, the final thing. Um, CAD is just a tool, it's just a pencil, modern pencil. Unfortunately, you have to draw, you have to CAD. It's, if you don't like CADing, just do it and uh, it will become second nature. Uh, it, it, it really is necessary and it's fun once you get into it. Six months usually to learn a CAD package. If you think you can do it any faster, wow. You're a superstar. Um, and this this product you can buy in um, all sorts of places where now JML is not doing. Um, I love transport, all sorts of transport. And um, during lockdown, I got a fantastic opportunity. You know, couldn't really go out this and to convert uh, one of my '60s loves, which is uh, a little Lotus Elan, into electric. And what inspires me about um, you know modern electric vehicles and things is that it's basically transport for free i mean i get from the solar panels on my roof up there about 100 miles of fun range in this little car and uh, it, what i wanted to show it, it's not just all about fun i want to show that a electric car can actually be as light, if not lighter, than the original petrol car. Because everybody says, oh, electric cars, they burn on fire, they, they're heavy, and all these sort of things. And I knew that was all myths, you know, usually from the young person the Daily Mail. This is actually lighter than a um, regular Elan, even though it's electric. Same range, slightly faster, um, handles just the same in silence. So that was it fantastic um, lockdown project. This was a project for Xiaomi. Xiaomi is a great big um, Chinese company which specialise in bringing good products at affordable prices, which also matches one of my mantras because there's no point in making a product which nobody can afford. It's not going to make the world a better place. Um, and what I learned from this really was that uh, a top of the range electric bicycle need only cost under 500 pounds to make and this is with gps bluetooth electric see-through wheels all this kind of thing um, uh, and and what this has led on to this particular project didn't go anywhere because funny enough they got into their scooter the 365 scooter which you've probably seen everywhere and they had about six factories knocking out 365 scooters so they didn't want to make a, a, an electric bike but it taught me that making a product affordable um, that normally costs you know five up to five grand more than a second-hand car is possible anyway latest project is an electric aeroplane and <laughs> sounds crazy but um, this actually only weighs uh, 66 kilos and it uses batteries and a very lightweight motor and um, I intend to fly this this summer so um, if you don't see me next year you know what happened. <laughs> Uh, anyway, let's let's move on. I'm going to show you now some projects that didn't last. Um, you know, it's, it's very nice to come up and say, oh, this was great, this was great, but it doesn't always work out like that. And I don't want anybody to have the impression that, you know, it's all sunshine and uh, easy in the product design world. Okay, this, uh, this was a wonderful project for a, a, a New York company who said about, ooh, it must be 14 years ago, we think there's a market for adult scooters. At the moment, kick scooters generally are for kids 
that we think is a market of adults gorgeous. Can you make one that, or design one that looks like an adult would use it? And um, it went nowhere. It didn't really get into proper production. We made a few prototypes, a few samples, and and yet now they're everywhere. So this product failed completely due to timing. It's a lovely product. It's, it's there for licensing. If anybody wants to license it, it works really well, folds up really great, can wheel it along. Anyway, next product that uh, didn't work um, was kind of technically and ergonomically a real, real benefit. I mean, you can peel a potato in about, you know, 50% faster than regular because it's got a curved blade, which cuts more skin than a flat blade, obvious really, but uh, not so obvious to store buyers. And as you're designing, this was a project with, again, with Joseph Joseph, as you're designing, um, you've got to think upstream, what is going to appeal to the buyers and, and, and get space on shelves, which is what it's like. And this just didn't cut, cut, cut it, basically. So another one. Yeah. Um, another one was uh, th this product here. Um, this was basically an industrial valve, and the whole point of it was that it it cost about 20% of what they normally cost using high performance plastics and things like that, and using something not normally used in this industry, a RC servo to power it, and they're made by the million. They're very reliable, so they're actually, you know, cross fertilizing the, the application. But this was dropped because the company was bought by another company and they just trimmed down their range. So, another product, several years' work, down the drain. So, it's not all, you know, honey and sunshine. This was a product that I'd spent a year on. Uh, what it is, you know, when you squeeze an orange, wouldn't it be nice if you could? You know, you have to squeeze about three or four, don't you, before it's a proper drink. And so this was a device that you could cut two oranges up, put them into the device and get a whole two oranges worth of drink. And it worked. But what I didn't realise is I, I worked on this just like an inventor, you know, in the back, back kind of room, making prototypes and testing it, this sort of thing. And I then went to potential manufacturers and also mainly people that market this sort of thing and said, look, it's great, it's great, isn't it? I designed it, look, isn't it great? And because I hadn't kind of collaborate, collaborated with them and I hadn't got them to buy into um, the, the whole design process, they went, yeah, it was not interested. <laughs> so again, another dead product. So the message on this one is collaboration. I think I'm going to talk about this in the end because having been locked onto an idea is a very, very powerful thing in not just the design world, but business and life generally. OK, next stage, I'm going to talk about the process I use to design, and it may be different from processes that you use, but it just works for me. I mean, I know there's all this stuff about double diamonds and all this kind of thing and design thinking and stuff, but uh, this is what works for me. Um, I'm not going to read all these out, but you can see um, in red the kind of things I've highlighted. Um, generally, uh, I mean, what is actually better without going into landfill? And better is such a global term. You can you can actually pull loads of things out of the world better. But dreaming for me about what could be, and in particular as a designer, what are we for? We create, we solve problems. That is the core thing that designers do. There are lots of other things that designers can do, but that's the one thing that they really should do. That's why I'm, you know, a bit fuzzy about design thinking and stuff like that. Um, and next stage, making it more real, testing, making in particular looks like works like prototypes, because it's so easy to make a CAD model that looks great, 
and people even invest a lot of money in it. And then, oh, can you make it work? Oh, no. <laughs> so at this quite early stage, um, making it work is important. Um, I suppose the most scary thing at the end is this 80% thing. When, when I'm honest, marketing and, marketing and distribution is 80% 80, 80 of the success of a product. It is so important, that communication. Uh, and getting it out there. So, uh, first product, chopping board. Uh, Most school chopping board, been in production for about 20 odd years. Um, started off, as most products did, with just sketching. And the core concept behind this is when one hinge crosses another hinge, only one hinge can ever flex. And just to show that you don't really can anything like this, this is the first prototype made out of a bit of cardboard with cut lines in it to test the principle. Okay, ever so straightforward. There's no barriers to entry into creating making a looks. Well, it's not really looks like it's a totally I mean, it's, a, it's very ugly. Um, sorry. Um, this is the works like product. You know, it's basically a piece of polypropylene cut out so that um, the hinges work to test the actual core principle. And then finally, the product of production. Again, with lots of collaboration with the company making it and the company marketing and selling it. Um, as I said, sketch models, early CAD, 20 years ago, this was CAD. And, but this is what actually allowed it to be, become real. It was the early days of trying to, had to prove that the plastic would flow over six hinges. And this technique proved it could. So putting together the guys that were going to market it, if you can make it for 80p and you can make the plastic flow and you've come up with the design, getting those three aspects together, got product. And it's, it's still selling, it uh, it's still works, and um, it's, it's a nice, nice product. Uh, saves you missing the pan, basically. Now, I've done a lot of can openers. They're, they're, they're a lovely, tricky little product. Um, and um, anyway, the can was invented in 1810. Fantastic way of making sure food didn't go off, move it around the world, got chips, all that sort of thing. Can opener was not invented for another 45 years. <laughs> and and uh, before that, they used to use hammers and chisels to get into cans. And an uh, absolute classic example of a product needing to be designed. Um, and anyway, this is one, one of the first can openers I did for a company in Hong Kong. And they wanted something that was totally automatic. Press the button, walk away, job done. And how I approach it was was a combination of working out the mechanism and the aesthetics by printing out CAD and then sketching over it and vice versa. Test rigs, so as you can see, incredibly crude. This was just to prove the principle. Um, and then the core mechanism and making making the these parts required a lot of kind of like working with rapid prototype people and micro CNC in this case. Um, and I actually hope that they make a, a clear version because um, apart from the, uh, <coughs> the shape, which is designed unlike a regular can of you, you've got to rub on your face and not kind of scratch it. Um, I actually quite like seeing the mechanism. Um, but the people marketing it in degree, so <laughs> you can't see any of that. Uh, now, one thing that I was taught at college, and I'm sure, I'm not sure if Nick teaches this, but um, uh, patents are really important, protecting your IP and um, all this sort of thing. It's super important, and not showing anybody and all this sort of thing. And I used to believe that, but I don't quite as much, although I still use it a bit. It's a bit of a myth. What patents and IP is for are these sort of guys. 
the venture capitalists and the people kind of raising money and that sort of thing. Uh, they're also promoted by the paper office as well, obviously. Um, but to actually use them to protect things requires a hell of a lot of money. And that's what nobody tells you when you patent something. And uh, in particular, another case study, this was the next one after the, after you do, well, what do you do? After you do a, a can opener, cool, jar opener. And that's this one here, which you're welcome to see. And um, this was probably the toughest product I've ever designed because apart from it having to work and everything, the BOM price, build of material price, had to be around about three US dollars. And this is something that, you know, does the same thing as a strong man holding a jar and a lid and doing that. And it had to keep working, had to open hundreds of jars without breaking. Uh, and again, just showing the design process, combination of mechanism sketches, aesthetic sketches, uh, CAD plus sketches, uh, test routes to make sure it works. And in particular, I, I always fall back to this kind of development where you've got a CAD layout to define the hard points and then you sketch over it to try and make it elegant you know, get the shape smooth, smooth and, and that sort of thing. Uh, anyway, uh, this was a hell of a product of design. It really was tough, you know, both from an engineering and a, 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 and a manufacturing point of view. Very, very first prototype put together, all CNC'd and then built up. And we've got a great patent. What we were trying to do had never been done before. Basically, uh, the core of it is a mechanical principle. If you're not into mechanical engineering, this will go full. But basically what it is, it's an epicyclic gearbox at the top there, um, which is a bit, acts also like a differential in the car. Sounds weird, but it does. And what it does, it proportions the torque between the top bit of the jaws and the bottom bit. So effectively what it's doing it's simulating what you do when you open a jar. You, you start to turn the lid and you feel it slipping a bit. So you grip the lid a bit harder and then the jar slips a bit to so grip the jar a bit harder and you go in opposite directions and it opens. And so that was the core of it. But what happened was um, you had this company, a huge red company in the US who kept asking for samples. Oh, send us another sample. We really like your product, blah, blah, blah. And another, and another. Oh, sure. God, our sales are going to be fantastic. This great big American company's interested. And it all went quiet. Didn't hear anything from them at all. And I'm thinking, oh God, should we go and see them? You know, should we rattle on okay? But anyway, next thing. Hello. That looks a bit familiar on the market. And uh, we we sent them a you know legal letter and say, you know, hey. He said, oh, we did that, we got patents. And they said, well, we've actually, we employ about uh, 40 patent agents and lawyers. You're welcome to sue us. And that sums up how the patent system really doesn't work. It's all down to how much money you've got. And for example, <laughs> just on the copying thing, they even copied some of my mistakes. <laughs> and so you see, uh, anyway, long story short. Uh, the thing about, uh, in a way, this is it's a double-edged sword, this. When a product is successful, nobody copies a product at concept stage. So they won't come around your degree show, see your product and say, oh, I'm having that. They wait until they've done all the hard marketing work and all the, you know, um, social media of actually getting it out there and getting the audience behind it and even some sales. And when you've done all that hard marketing work, then they'll copy it. <laughs> in a way it's a compliment, but in other ways it's not because um, the product's usually inferior and so it actually spoils your brand, but hey -oh. Anyway, this kind of sums up uh, the point about patents costing money. I mean, 
Dyson is a really big patenter. He patents everything. But occasionally, and he, he often wins in his huge patent battles until he comes up with someone, uh, uh, someone bigger like Samsung. In which case, it's like, OK, you're bigger, you win. And unfortunately, I know it sounds really cynical, but that is IP in a nutshell. So how as a designer with some great ideas get around all this? Um, and, and these are my tips. Um, pretty obvious, really. A competition and getting PR effectively nails you, the product and a date in time, which is actually what IP should do anyway. So I really recommend competitions. Um, Build a brand. One of my key competitors um, in the folding bike world, their patent expired years ago. But they got a fantastic brand. I'm not going to mention them because, well, Bronx are really good. Oh, yes. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, also, little tiny tip if you get design registration, which costs about 50 quid, and they get it transferred to America, it's called a design patent. And so you can say, oh, it's patented to the venture capitalists you meet who are going to, you know, take on Dragon's Den. Name and shame at trade shows, that always works. And finally, get over it. Just move on. You're a creative. You are here to create. So start creating. Let copies copy. Um, right. Personal transport has always been a mission for me. And I love this slide, whether it's flying, two wheels, four wheels, whatever. So I'm going to just kind of round out by showing a few bicycles, which really are my love. Um, transport's a global problem. I mean, we've been fed 100 years of car marketing and they always show cars driving on empty roads with, you know, roof down, wind in the hair. Reality is congestion. There are just too many cars. The car is just too good for the world, in a way. The product is brilliant. It's too brilliant. Everybody wants one, so there isn't room for them. And a bicycle, by comparison, is the perfect human amplifier. OK, I love that term because that's exactly what it does. You know, instead of going at three miles an hour, it takes you at 12 or 15 miles an hour. Same effort. Brilliant. But how do you make a bicycle mainstream? This is the image of bicycles for most non-cyclists. And it's pretty appalling from a product design point of view. It's complex, it's macro, it's more Formula One than Ford Fiesta. It's stack of high, sell and cheap. And it's a sporting activity. It's not, it's not for you and me, is it? I mean, it's for these guys in Lycra. So it does have an image problem. And as a product designer, I really, really, really want to try and change that image because bicycles are just so important for society. They transform cities, they really do. Um, I put this slide up because I think this is the approach on the left that the bicycle industry takes. This is the approach on the right, which I think consumer products industry takes. See the difference? They're both can openers, of course, but one is human form and for humans, the other one is easy to make and is probably very efficient. Well, that's both efficient, but one is just efficient and not very human form. Um, this is a very cruel slide. This is a real bitchy, bitchy, bitchy slide. This is a slide I've made to, to say, um, what if a bicycle designer designed a mobile phone? What would it look like? And of course, it would have external chain, and gears, and um, cables, and sharp bolts and things. And the point I'm trying to make is bicycle design needs to take on a lot more consumer product orientation to make it human. And in major markets, this is the kind of, um, you know, the people that actually ride bikes compared to the people that don't. It's generally 20 20. It could be off as little as five to ninety five or whatever, depending on where you are. And there's a lovely book 
in fact, is a strategy called Blue Ocean Strategy, which sums up the situation in the bicycle industry perfectly. And basically, Blue Ocean Strategy is its definition of marketing. And it shows that when the market's crowded, the ocean is turned red with the blood of all the competitors fighting over this tiny little 20%. Whereas they're ignoring this huge, great blue ocean. And that's where the opportunities are. It's, it's a perfect analogy for the bike industry. And so just to hammer the point home, the bike industry tends to concentrate on this guy and tends to ignore the aspirations of everybody else. This can be applied to many other products, incidentally. Um, but what is it for? It's actually for transport, not just sport. It's for getting around, surely. Um, and why must you wear weird stuff? Why can't you just wear your own clothes? Like they do in Amsterdam and Copenhagen. Um, why must you, you know, ride a bike like you're doing a Tour de France? Why not just sit up and ride it normally? I mean, this is what the industry sells us, I'm afraid. And hey, I'm actually part of that industry, scary enough, the bike industry. Um, why not upright for comfort and being able to see? This is what I call the blue ocean. All demographics, male and female, urban environment, not really caring about sport. And these are some of the products that I've tried to work on to move the whole industry in this direction. A um, whole variety of different bikes. I'm going to show you a couple of them. Um, and what uh, the kind of common theme amongst them, uh, right from Strider days, was, hey, you've got a pair of wheels, why not use them to wheel the thing along when it's folded? This is the Strider, um, and I'm going to just show you how it was designed, because it was actually my student project at college. Um, and it started off being inspired instead of something really packing really small. Why not make it long and thin like a baby one? And truth to form, sketchy. It was, I hate to say, this was before CAD. Um, sketching was the only means of, of developing ideas. And that was the earliest, earliest sketch at the time. Um, and, you know, I um, spent a lot of money in the RCA shop buying Dela pads. And lots and lots of sketches. I've been down to your shop and it's really good. You've got all this kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, little models help me kind of work out the 3D form. They don't have to be sophisticated, you know, just like the cardboard chopping board. Um, but it helped because it's, you're talking about a 3D product. It's got to be 3D, not just 2D. Um, this is a fully adjustable test rack. This is my late father. Actually, he's huge, much bigger than me, believe it or not. And uh, it, we had to make the product fit both him and small people. And so to test all the geometry and how it steers and things, this is a fully adjustable rig. I like this slide because it's the very first working prototype. And it shows that the bike's just got three tubes and three joints. As another bike with 11 tubes and 11 joints goes cycling past. Yet again, uh, there are a lot of copies. If, if if you could count all the copies as well as the official ones, it's probably a, uh, one of the highest manufactured folding bikes, but you'd never guess that. Most of them tend to stay in China and the Far East. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. Um, it's Oh, you still no, I, I must make the point here. I don't actually own any of these companies at all. They've either been licensed or sold. So, although when I say so I'm working, yeah, yeah, I'm a one man band. I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't own companies or anything else. But you used to produce them in. I mean, it's very interesting, the story of Strada is very interesting, so I don't know if you want to get into it now, I don't want to disrupt your flow, but it's such a, such a, a great project. Yeah. And, and in my mind, because I've been following you know, the project since the beginning, I thought you saw it because I saw it in China, I saw it all over the world. 
what, what happened was, um, I'm, the thing about, a, a, quick, a quick red herring for you. Okay. Um, as you are here, you get a fantastic opportunity towards the end of your time at the, you know, at Central St. Martins, your degree show, because lots of reporters and things come to that and they look at all the greatest products. You've also got a massive opportunity with social media, which I didn't have then. And I used that opportunity as a launch plan to get this product out in front of people's eyeballs. Right? Simple as that, just as you want to do in social media. And I wanted to attract potential manufacturers. And I met with a guy who wanted a product to start a business with. And so we worked together. And that, that's how, uh, and funny enough, the first company actually went bust. And so all the IP reverted back to me, which I then licensed to another company. That one went, they well, didn't go bust, it changed. And then anyway, the IP came back to me. And so it's, it's a licensing thing. You use to manufacturing in England or over? It's been made all over the place. It's been made the first in, company was in Glasgow. Okay. Then it was made in Nottingham. Yeah. Then it was made in Portugal. Then it was made um, back in UK. Then it was made in Taiwan. And then it, it's now made in a combination of Taiwan and China. But I, I, I don't have any, in fact, I have very little control of it now. They, 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 they want to do their own thing, the manufacturers and the people that market it. Yeah, so I've seen the colors change. Yes, yeah, that, that, that's uh, nothing to do with me. Now, I'm pushing them to do an electric version. But um, uh, it, it, it basically, as the original designer, you don't, unless you actually start your own business and do it all yourself. So, so yeah, so I don't want to kind of uh, stop your, your the flow, but please, at one point, maybe at the end, because I think it's very, very interesting for everyone to hear about your decision making, because this could easily become a company that you own and you manufacture and so on. But you decided to. Yeah. To license and exactly. To start that Licensing is difficult, but yes, that's the route I did, did actually succeed at. I wouldn't recommend it. It's really hard to license a product. But funny enough, full circle, I'm now working on a new folding bike, which I'm actually doing myself yeah. in the UK. But that's a zip. <laughs> anyway, uh, where do we get to? I still want. Th this is another bike. And I, I felt as you look around most cities, you see people cycling. Most tend to be on bigger wheels because a bigger wheel tend to be uh, more stable and more. You don't look like a kind of on a kid's bike. And so this was my attempt to do a folding large wheel bike. And the design process was basically making the whole thing, obviously lots of sketches, etc., etc., et making the whole thing in wood, seeing how it worked. With lots of FEA and engineering to build test rigs. Um, and finally, the first prototype, which actually had a shaft drive, but it didn't keep that. Um, and this again went through a couple of companies before I managed to license it to it, the people that finally make it Pacific Cycles. Um, and um, testing was great fun. You know, when you design a bike, I mean, I've got scars to prove it, but you end up doing loads, loads of testing to make sure it works. So, question of the bike then. Is that right? This particular one, yeah. um, with the shaft drive, it came out at something like 13 kilos. With a chain drive, it came down to about 12. So, it was still a bit on the beefy side, um, but um, the carbon fiber version never took off. So, anyway, it, it, one thing it did do for the company licensed it to. Pacific Cycles, a fantastic company, was that it won them lots of awards. Uh, because again, it wasn't just me this, it was a collaboration. They're a bicycle factory. And I learned so much from them as I did my, my you know, the stuff I imported was only part of the story. Um, there are different versions. There's a mountain bike version. Simon is demonstrating in full mountain bike gear. And there's a smaller wheel version. And um, yeah, it's, it's a nice product. It's, it's a bit too expensive for my liking, but um, hell. Uh, and finally, uh, 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 this is coming towards the end. I'm going to show you a 
project, I had the fantastic opportunity to do some pure industrial design. And this was with a company called Mando, who you've probably never heard of, who are effectively Asia's version of Bosch. They make, you know, if you drive a car, brakes and suspension and that sort of thing, Mercedes, whatever, you, you, I've probably got a lo load of Mando parts in. And I spent many hours in their sole office, um, eating kimchi and um, staying up till 10 at night, because God, those guys work hard. We are so, by comparison, <laughs> Brits only work eight hours. They work you know, 10 hours, 12 hours without a break. Uh, I learned a lot on those trips. Anyway, they have the foresight. Remember, they're a, the car industry, right? Making cars. They had the foresight to say, where is transporting cities going? And they could see this need for um, smaller, basically, for smaller transport. And they put all their engineering together and came up with this, which is basically a hybrid e-bike. What that means is it's got a battery in it, and it's also got an alternator, but no chain. And so when you pedal it, you effectively charge the battery and the battery drives the motor, which sounds a bit odd and a bit inefficient, which is not particularly efficient. But the key thing is it gets around one of the major hurdles of e-bike makers is that they're now not allowed to have throttles. It's purely an e-bike now is the force it gives out is only proportional to the force you put in. So effectively, the cranks are like a throttle on this bike. And once you understand that, it makes perfect sense. Anyway, the dream project was to turn this engineering um, exercise into something that was more elegant. And, and this was the first version. Um, and uh, you, you can see it, it's, it uses one of my favorite things. It, the wheels fold together so you can roll it and it has the battery inside and it folds really quick and this sort of thing. Um, and it's quite a success in, in Korea, not so much over here because people never really understood the um, the hybrid system. You know, well, I've got chain, it's no good, well, next. Um, but what inspired me on the aesthetics, we are designers after all, is especially on folding products, a bird's. You think about a bird's wings, they're structural, and yet they fall down to nothing in their, in their bodies. Just total magical inspiration for anybody designing something that falls. And lo and behold, um, took this stage further in a way, the central core of this uh, bike is this huge great joint, very much like the joint of a bird's wing bone. Um, anyway, it, uh, it, it's been quite useful. And again, part of the design, it sells with average. Uh, it was fairly cheap for an e-bike. Um, but what it did do, it got the company, remember they're only a first tier supplier, so nobody's heard of them, but it got them some a design awards. And so that raised their profile, social media and all that sort of thing is important to every company, whether you're small or large. Um, and they went on to develop what I found more exciting was a low cost version. Uh, and, and, and basically, I think if you're going to make a change in the world, it has to be for everybody. In other words, it has to be affordable. If you want to make products that are really expensive, only a few people can afford them. It's not going to make the world a better place. So this is really inspiring. Um, it's a super cheap frame with just like Nokia, what is it, 6302s? Six, six, six you know, the, basically, there used to be mobile phones where you snapped on covers, and that's exactly the same. Um, this product is a really cheap frame with beautiful plastic snap on covers to, to change its aesthetics. Anyway, I'm coming to name now, and I want to bring up this issue. Ownership. This is something that I've come across a lot. And I, I, I'm showing my design heroes here. But as designers, we tend to think of our ideas as being very precious. And we want to own them. And 
even in a brainstorming session, if your idea is the one that's chosen, you kind of feel good inside, don't you? You know, that's my idea, you know. But in fact, you've got to, uh, what, I've, what I've found, and I'm trying to share a, a life's worth of uh, kind of stabs in the back, um, is, although it is instinctive to keep your own idea, it's much better if you can collaborate and that the best idea goes forward, not necessarily your idea. And especially in the design college where, you know, it's my painting, it's a very hard thing to, a very hard message to get across. But it's really, really important. Um, so ideas, ownership, just, rem just think about it as you. So I think generally the best concept wins. And I've got so many great concepts by working with other people like Joseph Joseph, toolmakers and things like that, who taught me stuff. So although I've shown you some products that I've kind of shown ownership for, there's loads of other people that are actually part of that ownership journey. So, who do you want to be? Having heard that, do you want to be a star like, like uh, some of those previous guys? Superstar designer? Do you want to just be a backroom designer that just creates for your own satisfaction? Do you want to be an engineer? Do you want to just concentrate on the form and nothing else? I don't know. We're all different. But I'd love you to come away from this lecture and think about your own journeys. Where you're going to go from here? You've got so many opportunities and we're all different. So, ask your 10 year old self where you want to go, and I'm sure you'll come up with some really, really good answers. So, that's me. Thank you very much for attention. Good timing. Very yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, many thanks, Mark. That's really, it's really super helpful and really great tour around uh, uh, some of your projects and uh, experiences. That's very generous of you. Thanks. So I want to open up uh, the floor for questions. Um, we, ha we have one at the front. Oh, we need to turn the amp back on. It was misbehaving. This is where we get Camden rap coming through the amp. Yeah. <laughs> Tim. Thank you, um, I'm interested to know, what are your thoughts on Kickstarter and um, have you done one, uh, what do you know about it? I do know about it. Um, I think it is a really good way of getting products both out there. Um, with the, the, it, it, it's very good at solving that horrible stage between um, coming up with working prototypes and getting into production because it allows money to come in up front people placing orders up front to um, which then gives you money to invest in tooling etc and make the product affordable. The one downside is it's been a bit over abused and people over promise on it. That's where I mentioned the thing about um, it's no good just making a really good CAD model or even a crude prototype. You've got to prove it. You've got to make it look Camden Massive are actually doing. <laughs> Sorry, it's new satire. Yes. Uh, uh, do, is this working okay if I speak up? Yeah, I think it's fine. It's just the people in the room speak louder when they ask the questions. It's fine. Don't okay. Worry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think yes, it is good, um, uh, but you've got to be really careful because of the people that have abused it using things that are proven and then bullshitting about them and saying this just is the have you heard the, the, the best term in Kickstarter is the world's first or the world's best. It's almost like de facto statement at the start of any Kickstarter. I think. But the general principle of actually getting people to place orders in advance of getting their product is a win-win situation because they will get it at a much cheaper price potentially and you can invest that those sums as soon as you get several orders um, into things like tooling which will reduce the, the 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 cost of the product 
So it's a kind of win-win if it works. Does that answer your question? No, I think, uh, it's not working anymore. <laughs> to, to do one yourself or a bike? We're thinking of doing one on this next bike um, as a potential. Um, we've noticed, I say we, me and a, a, a kind of a business partner is more interested in the manufacturing side. Um, and um, he he's very keen on doing it. But you've got to get all your ducks lined up. You've got to get your IP lined up. You've got to get your marketing campaign lined up. You've got to get a PR lined up. You've got to get perfectly working products. Otherwise, you could be accused of, you know, um, well, there's no liability on Kickstarter. So, you, but if you launch a product and then you don't deliver, you're not going to do it again, are you? Your reputation is, is ruined. So, there you go. Great, thanks. Um, the, 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 did I answer your question earlier about about I think, manufacturing? I think for everyone, there is one super interesting point about designers starting businesses. Yeah. So I mean, manufacturing businesses. Yes. So every every product can uh, can become a small manufacturing business. Yes. And and the strata. I followed the strata straight from the beginning. I was, you know, and I, and in my mind, you are you are after exit. So, if in my mind you sold the company and you are you know you did extremely well. So, looking from the from the and now I understand what the decision was to license and then, and and with a, such a great product as the strider. Such a great product because it's so well engineered. It's super iconic. It's uh, it's kind of groundbreaking in some funny way, and, and it's very affordable to make. So yeah. so you have everything there to actually go and take a bit of risk and start a company and manufacture them. That's what I'm trying to do next. But when I was in my twenties, I didn't have the knowledge, the money, or the desire to start a business. Since then, I've worked on lots of bikes for other people. And the reason that now I want to start a business to make my own bike is because there are so many, when you're working as a consultant for other people, there's so many other, other factors that come into the design. I mean, it's a pretty crude thing to say, but you know, the director's wife likes the color pink. The bike's got to be pink. Those kind of, I mean, that's a very crass statement and I, I don't want to be misogynistic or anything like that, but do you see what I mean? The decisions on the design as a, a, as a consultant are often taken away from you and left to the people that are funding it and things like that. Not always the best result. Uh, that's what happened to the, the um, Charming project. It was basically, it was going really, really well. And then it, it was a, it was a, marketing stroke manufacturing decision to just drop it. And, and sorry, one last question. But, uh, but after how, let's say, because this was the RCA major project? Yeah, yeah, it's a student and, project. And uh, maybe you can say, because it might be inspiring for, for the students, maybe um, how much time uh, do you take you to kind of Complete the project and give it to a manufacturer. Um, a year. A year. I started it before I started the final year. And and it was kind of a royalty mechanism. Thing. No, 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 no. It was. It was. I. The course I was on was a combination of design and engineering. The engineering was um, examined by Imperial College to a quite a reasonably high standard. The design was examined by the Royal College of Art. And so I had to keep both the design and the engineering aspects happy. In fact, that's what I love anyway. So it wasn't too difficult, but it were both hurdles to jump through. And so, you know, in that year, I concentrated super, super hard on, on, on making it. And the, to be fair, there was also a family thing at the time. Um, right at the start of the project, my brother, was killed on a motorcycle accident. And so I was actually pretty down at the time. And so I put all my energy into that project, which is, you know, 
we all have factors like that yeah. that that inspire us or whatever. So that's that's the kind of background. Any other questions in the room? I've got one or two online. Yes. Yes. Okay. When you're, for example, designing um, a product and you're pushing, say, the technology of whatever the manufacturing process, say it's folding or um, injection molding or casting, reach out to the manufacturers who do that as their daily job. They will be massively um, inspirational and helpful with the, so much knowledge, they will help you develop your product. Uh, and so I've learned so much from talking to tool makers. And you know, they said, you know, if you put the draft on this way or the split line there or whatever, it'll be a lot easier to make and it'll look better. Oh yeah, that's a good idea, yeah. And that's the kind of collaboration. I particularly get a lot of collaboration with makers people that spend all their time, for example, you know, casting or making fabric, sewing, whatever. Uh, and the other people I get a lot of input from are the people that actually have to go and market and sell and distribute the products. People like Joseph Joseph, who I love working with because they're both designers, uh, Tim works with them as well. Um, and they, show me different aspects of of what it, what the customer would need that I haven't even thought of. Now design thinking says I as a designer should go out and and um, find out what the customer needs but I think that's a bit disrespectful to the manufacturers like jo or the marketing people like Joseph Joseph who know their customers and they know what the customers want and as I said at the start, I think as a designer, our role is to create. But that might be slightly controversial. Good question. Um, I'm, I'm just I just think it's worth noting. Um, Anthony Joseph is a graduate of this school. Yeah, yeah. just saying, just saying. <laughs> I, I've said, <laughs> Anthony is Anthony and Richard. Well, both of them are so enthusiastic. Mm. And I, I, I mean, I'm sure Tim will say the same. A design crit meeting with them, you come out like the sparks coming out of your head because they've added so much input and so many suggestions to the, the product. And that's classic collaboration. The enthusiasm and the drive of those two brothers is amazing. It was honestly, every project I've done with them has been an absolute joy, even the ones that they've eventually dropped. But hey, hope that was that was the fun. Um, it's, uh, it's, I'm just, just looking at Charlie, who's promising a question before. Before I get to Charlie, um, there's a question here. Um, I'm just curious as to how you managed to keep it for life. <laughs> nine volt battery. Yes, nine volt battery. Yeah. Uh, really simple. Okay. Um, electric motors don't weigh very much, batteries weigh a lot. Petrol doesn't weigh much engines weigh a lot. Simple as that. So the the and, and the, I don't know why the motor industry doesn't get that. It's because in, in, in strict terms, the the motor weighed the, the engine I took out and sold to pay for the electrics weighed 125 kilos. The motor weighed 50 kilos and the batteries weighed about 120 kilos. But there's no petrol, so it ended up 20 kilos lighter. There's so much fud about electric vehicles out there, saying you know they're heavy and they don't last. And also, it's I, I don't know what I think it's the oil industry trying to stop them basically. Anyway, there you go. Does that answer your question? Yeah. We've got a question online for you, uh, Mark. Uh, what's your favourite project out of all those you've worked on? Probably the last one I'm working on, to be honest. There's, all, there's always another challenge down the road, but I would say the hardest problem, project, uh, in a way, my favourite a lot of challenges was this, because if, if you have a look at it afterwards, there's so much going on inside this, you know, $3 costing mechanism. 
and it's 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 called in America it's called a Robo Twist, which is a brilliant name, Robot Twist, <laughs> and um, it was a really tough project this to get get the price down, get the ergonomics right, and all that sort of thing. So this is the toughest, and also a great challenge. The favourite is the next one to come, which is currently an aeroplane, but it could be something. It could be a scooter next next year. It could be a bicycle. Uh, one more here for you, um, and, and I think this is making reference to your looking at uh, wing wing joints and yeah. stuff like that. Do you think that using biomimicry at the heart of a design process can make it easier to solve problems? Absolutely. I mean, biomimicry um, is such inspiration. You know, uh, uh, how I get my inspiration is, you know, I, uh, uh, I spend hours referencing similar products and things like that, you know, do the Zulu principle, going really, really deep uh, onto a very narrow area. Um, but to get real kind of step jumps of new ideas, uh, nature has solved so many problems. It's, it's so inspiring. So, you know, the, 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 I'm, I, what, I live by the coast and I just watch seagulls a hell of a lot of the time. But they're so brilliant as flying structures, you know, interesting flying and interesting folding. And seagulls are the perfect flying folding structure. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, I just, just want to be this series is about transformation yeah. and you've transformed products, you've transformed businesses, I guess. Well, I look at Joseph Joseph, they would they would they would claim that your invention is part of their success yeah. and not a small part of their success. So what about your own personal transformation, your journey through this through this uh, realm of of invention of engineering, collaboration mistakes? What, looking back, could, can you find any particular pivotal moments that have shifted the way you you engage with what you do if i'm perfectly honest i think it was confidence i really, when i started out i didn't really have much confidence um i knew i was good at creating stuff and solving problems but i thought mm, i'm not that confident and it, it, i suppose the transformation over time is to is to what transformed for me is i learned to follow my instincts especially for what would work, what would look good, what would be possibly manufacturable when I'm really pushing the limits. And it's only taken me 20, 30 years to come to that conclusion. Um, but what I would point out to you guys, just think about all the amazing people who've done the most amazing stuff in their 20s. You know, we're talking, you know, all the greats, Mozart and people like that. They were all doing the best stuff because when I did the Strider, I didn't know it couldn't be done. So I just did it. And if, if now I know, looking back, it was actually quite an achievement. Um, but at the time it was, oh, it's got to make it work, you know, and that doesn't work. OK, let's change this bit. That doesn't work. OK, change that bit. So I wish as a youngster at your age, I had more confidence in myself and instinct, you know, trusted my instincts more. Does that answer your question? That's a really good answer. Yeah, thank you. Just just before we sort of wrap up, I just want to take a show of hands here. Sure. Anybody in the room do own or have owned a Strider bicycle? Uh, I, I'm dreaming about it. <laughs> oh, all right. OK, dream about it. Okay. Anybody in the room? own or have owned a no spill chopping board thank you guys that's really not bad going it. is it <laughs> it's not bad going that know the products They're great and i'm just just reminded you've talked a lot about collaboration that's great you've also talked about creativity and to a lesser degree to communication according to uh yuval noah harari yeah. this is um lessons for the 21st century there's three things that we're going to need need to be able to do collaborate well, to, to be, exercise creativity, and to communicate well. And wow. I, I think you've been an exemplar here, Mark. So I just I want- know, I didn't know that, that's his latest work. Uh, yes, yes, wow. yeah, last, last yeah. book, yeah. 
That's amazing. It's not bad, is it? Um, so I just want to say thanks as well and to invite everybody in the room to to join me and give you a round of applause. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thank you.